webinar for the IOD. We really appreciate it. Um, so Richard's going to speak and at the end we will have uh, time for questions. So if you do have any questions, please um, use the chat function or raise your hand uh, if you look at the bottom right hand screen. So Richard, without further ado, I will um, like to invite you to speak and uh, give your presentation. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Kirsty, and thank you to you and uh, Chelsea for the opportunity to deliver this webinar. So this one's potentially a bit more upbeat. There's some more uh, emerging figures coming out that actually look quite good for the Northern Ireland economy. Um, as people begin to return to work and as some normal activity begins to resume. So again, thanks to Ryan Hogg and Gillian McCausland, two of our assistants that have worked very hard in this in the background as well with me. Um, so a lot of what you'll see is uh, as a result of their hard work as well. So in terms of the death tolls, obviously death tolls are rising across the world, uh, about 450,000 deaths at the minute and eight and a half million cases. The US is by far a, a global leader in this competition, which is an invidious position to be in. And Brazil has now overtaken the UK um, as the, the second worst affected country. So not a great record for the UK over the last number of months. Um, but as anyone will know who's been affected directly by it, it's a, it's a terrible illness. Um, and obviously our thoughts are with anybody and any family that have been affected. When we look at the, the curves and how we're progressing, um, there's a feeling that things have improved markedly, but I would say that we're not out of the woods yet. Whilst it's better in the island of Ireland, uh, we certainly have flattened the curve. It's a lot better than maybe initial estimates had proved. And we're much better than perhaps England, Wales or Scotland. So Northern Ireland and Ireland, maybe the informal lockdowns that took place a little bit earlier, and then um, maybe sort of more rural populations help as well. But certainly our death toll are lower than other parts of the UK. If we move to look at economic impacts and forecasts, you can see here that the, the forecasts are becoming more gloomy as time goes on. So those that were released in March, a bit of growth, April, moderate decline, May, a more significant decline, and then June, you know, more significant declines across the world. So the consensus forecasts are in around sort of three to six percent of uh, reduction in global output over 2020 as a result of the COVID induced restrictions. If we look at single hit and double hit forecasts from the OECD, here we can see that the UK, um, third most seriously hit country in terms of deaths, um, is also expected to have a significant uh, reduction in size of the economy over the, the 2020 period. So perhaps in around 12 percent for a, a single hit. Um, COVID impact. And then if we get a second wave in the autumn, that could potentially reduce to maybe 14.5% or so being shaved off GBA over the year. So a very significant reduction, much more significant than 2008, um, and very rapid as well. And if we look at how, they, how those impacts are being filtered through the economy, effectively, the economy is made up of consum consumption. So that's what people buy investment, what businesses are spending on capital investment, government expenditures, so that's things like uh, program expenditure, wages, and um, benefits payments and pensions and all of that sort of stuff, and then exports and trade. So those are really the, the elements of your economy. And that's, if you want to grow an economy, you need to boost consumption, boost investment, boost government expenditure, or your trade balance. So here you can see we have OECD forecasts for Ireland and um, for the UK, and then we have our own EPC forecast for, for Northern Ireland. So what you can see is quite a significant hit in terms of consumption as people rein back in spending, businesses hang back in capital investment, and then the public sector tries to plug some of that gap with additional spending. If we look at the overall position, um, EPC, we now reckon that the impact of the recession will be 12-13% um, during 2020. So that's a, a very significant recession, it's quite quick. Um, and if you look at the last recession, which took about five quarters to unwind, um, this has been quite rapid. It's really over about one quarter um, and effectively over maybe two months. EY have taken a, an upper and lower bound approach, so minus 6.7 to minus 10. Now, those were published, um, I think, in March, April. So again, there may be an update to those uh, later in the autumn. KPMG and Danske Bank are a bit more positive, so smaller contractions there. KPMG reckon that Northern Ireland is more protected by having a larger public sector, um, a larger agricultural and agri-food manufacturing set sector, which are fair points. Um, but also we've, we've had a, a sort of structural challenge with high levels of inactivity, low levels of productivity, and higher levels of 
um, consumer debt going into the recession as well. So those are all factors where the assumptions vary across the different forecasting organizations, but that gives you a feel for the, the size of the recession this year. So on to some positive news, there's been signs of reignition across the economy. Um, a number of industries are now getting back to some normal. So it may be termed as a 90% economy. Um, you can see here that utilities, uh, professional, scientific, manufacturing, transport and storage, a lot of those uh, industries are getting back to normal. But on the right hand side, a combination of food services, so your restaurants and hotels, and then arts and entertainment, so theatres, museums, all of that sort of stuff, you know, down to 25, 30% of, of previous output. So those are sectors that going forward will need a significant amount of support in terms of survival and getting through this gap in demand and, and social distancing. Retail sales have begun to recover, so you can see a bounce back here um, going up to May. So the April figures were uh, a significant low. And the shift in demand here has also changed mar markedly away from face-to-face -face shopping towards online purchasing. So the retail, uh, the high seat street has changed markedly. Um, and as we change all of our behaviors, the retail sector will, will change quite a bit actually over the next number of years as well. So that's an acceleration of an existing trend, um, but it's good to see there are some resumption in activity. You should note that this is for GB. We don't have very much data that's sort of Northern Ireland focused specifically, um, but we would expect that as shops begin to reopen, Northern Ireland will follow a similar path. The question is, how long does that V continue? Does it turn right and become a, a Nike swoosh? Does it continue back up to say 110 where it was and become a just a pure V? Or is there a bit of a W in there? So these things are beginning to, to take uh, hold across the economy and there's conversations about that. Furlough numbers, these are Invest and I client company numbers. These were kindly provided by Invest and I to us and EPC. So as you can see here, there's about, um, I suppose 27,000 remain furloughed, 13,000 are returning to work in about 350 companies. So Invest and I assist directly about 1,500 companies across Northern Ireland. That's their core client company base. Um, about 20% of all people who are on furlough would be in Invest and I client companies. So smallish number of companies across the broader economy, but these are the bigger uh, companies that do a lot of exports. They invest in R&D, the high productivity, high wage, high skill in general. Um, and very export oriented. So you can see here the encouraging um, green line along the bottom where people are beginning to return off furlough, the flattening of the total number where companies are not um, actually getting onto the furlough scheme anymore. And then as people return, the patterns here are in the most impacted sectors and areas. So advanced engineering, about 50% are expected to be returning to their jobs now. Um, and Mid Ulster, which is a heavily manufacturing dependent local council, about 50% are expected to return there as well. The patterns across councils are very different. So Newry, Morn and Down, Fermanagh and Oma and Causeway Coast and Glens. We expect only about 13 or 14% to be returning in those areas. Um, and that's because those are focused predominantly in areas like um, tourism and restaurants and hotels and arts and entertainment. So those are the elements that aren't necessarily returning as quickly. And it really depends on the composition of the, the local economies. Um, and the sectors that are returning to work as well. Traffic rate, rates are getting back to normal. You can see here the past three weekends, we have peaked above the, the sort of pre-lockdown high. So a lot of this might be leisure travel, but still people are out and about. Retail footfall is increasing. So you can see here pretty much across every council area in Northern Ireland, the, the patterns are very, very similar. So we're beginning to tick up in terms of people that are going back to visit retail. And then as well, in terms of shipping, as we bring goods and services in and out of Northern Ireland, shipping has begun to take up, not back to where it was, but the trend is upwards um, and ships are beginning to come into dock a little bit more full than they were previously as well. So that's good news across the economy. HGV movements as well have been in an upward trend. So back to about 75% of normal in inverted commas activity. Um, so look, there's a, there's a number of uh, impacted indicators there that are, are showing a, a positive response. Now, if we look at policies that are in place across the UK and Northern Ireland, across the world, you've had an unprecedented policy response. The UK has spent about a quarter of output um, in terms of the direct response to COVID. Germany has spent about 50%. Um, so massive uh, policy responses across the piece to try and 
shield from the, the, the impacts of COVID on the economy. You can see here coronavirus job retention scheme. This is what's called a furlough scheme. Across Northern Ireland, about 212,000 people were in furlough. So pretty similar in terms of the, the proportions um, across councils there um, in many instances. Um, Belfast, it's a pretty large number, but a low share. There's a lot of public sector workers, um, a lot of professional services, IT and finance, which are less impacted. They've worked at home rather than go on to furlough. Um, but then you can see the likes of Antrim, North Down, Mid and East Antrim. So again, you're back to areas that have a lot of construction, a lot of manufacturing, a lot of tourism and hospitality um, have been the most impacted. Similar then for the self-employment scheme, the average uh, awards just between two and three thousand pounds um, and a, you know, close to sort of 50 percent of companies that are eligible have claimed those, um, those benefits. So there's a good uptake across council areas. If you move on to the Northern Ireland Executive, there's been about 1.3 billion pounds of additional spending allocated to Northern Ireland. So that's a significant shot in the arm um, for the economy in Northern Ireland. So you add to that the coronavirus job retention scheme, the self-employed scheme, um, large sea bills and all of that sort of stuff. Um, the public spending response has been, has been huge. And here you can see that in a, in a chart that we've prepared. So you can see the um, departmental expenditure, which is the gray line in the middle. That's the bit that Northern Ireland's executive has direct control over has increased a little bit over the last year. The COVID response, the 1.3 billion adds to that. And then annually managed expenditure, which is benefits. Now we've made an estimate um, in terms of the increasing numbers of inactive and unemployed over the year, and what that might mean for benefits spending in Northern Ireland. But really what we're seeing here is, a, is a, an increase of about 8% in real terms over the year, and um, potentially this year. So a massive uplift in, in spending. Um, and that comes off really, a, I suppose, a decade of austerity up to about 2017, 18, a slight increase then in 18, 19, 19, 20, and then the, the massive COVID response over the last year. So what we see now is a huge swathes of employment that are supported by government. So those that are still at work in the private sector make up about 30%, private sector furloughed 17%, um, and then those that work in and are working in the public sector anyway at this point in time is about 22%, so about a fifth of people roughly work in the public sector. We then have the government picking up the tab in terms of unemployment benefits, um, some pensions as well for those who are potentially retired and others that are in welfare as well. So the government here, this is a very interesting and it's a, it's a quite uh, stark chart when you look at it. Um, the government's potentially supporting about 55% of the economy in terms of spending at this point in time. So a significant labour market impact and you can understand the potential anxiety in Treasury as they work out how they're going to fund this um, type of activity and return to normal in the longer term. So again, they would like to see potentially 60, 70% of the economy um, work in the private sector in the longer term. The FA have also launched their policy document about rebuilding a stronger economy. So that focuses on higher skills, um, addressing the skills gap and focusing on regional imbalances across Northern Ireland. So really that's their first um, entry into the, the sort of recovery plan. Um, and a lot of these challenges did exist pre-COVID and have been accelerated in the post-COVID world. If we look at policies and supports and when they end, this is a particularly interesting discussion for economists and policymakers at the minute. There's a cliff edge happening here really in July. So um, the question is, what gets extended? You know, what will Rishi Sunak do with FAT? Um, what will happen to the deferral of self-assessment and all those sorts of things? Will they be uh, moved forward? Will VAT be reduced? Will income tax or any of the other taxes be reduced now to give another sort of consumption spending boost in the arm for the economy? Then we get out to October and there's a second cliff edge as a number of other schemes begin to come to an end and wind down. So really there's a question here of what can be done um, at a later point in time in the autumn if there's a second wave, what happens um, and then what can be afforded by government? So, Effectively, there's a, there's a significant challenge as, as the unwinding of policies approach. So if we look at how our behaviours have changed, and this is actually one of the most important things about what we do and how we do it. If we're going to return to some form of normality, we as individuals actually have to behave in some way, shape or form that resembles the normality that we would like, because it's not really enough to say we would like other people to go out and spend and um, 
return to what we did before, but um, that'll apply to all of us across the piece. So across Northern Ireland, a massive reduction in presence in the workplace, so Belfast, quite office-based, public sector, professional services, all that sort of stuff, um, down by almost two thirds. Less impacts across um, a lot of the other economies, and you can see the more rural um, economies um, less impacted by not returning to the workplace. But again, down by almost half in some of the least impacted areas. What we've done, we've moved online. Um, and when we ask people what they plan to do in a post-COVID world, many of them say that they plan to stay. So the future is going to be more about a blended working, shopping, entertainment and gaming um, environment. So we reckon that there's maybe about 48 to 55% of people working at home Pre-COVID, that was about 11%. Um, and post-COVID, uh, the CEBR reckoned that about 25% of people could be working at home in any given day by 2025. So we plan to shop online more frequently, use video calling conferences, um, all of those sorts of things. Or there'll be more gaming and more use of logistics and food delivery online. So our patterns have changed. It takes about six, seven weeks to change a behavior. And here, what we would we'd say is that there's a massive change in behavior. Um, and again, an acceleration of existing trends that probably won't go back to where it was in the future. Again, that reduction in commuting has reduced, or reduced emissions and improved air quality. And this is a massive positive. If you look at the air quality across Belfast, um, nitrogen dioxide in particular from exhaust gases, um, way, way down. And that's a massive improvement for people who maybe have respiratory challenges or illnesses as well. Consumers here, you can see that they're um, certainly saving and they're paying down debt rather than spending. Um, that's a massive challenge in terms of uh, averting the deflation in the longer term in the economy. So that's where the, the Treasury are quite worried. That's where Rishi Sunak's talking about VAT. And that's why um, we don't want to see a reduction in prices across the piece because what will happen will be consumers then will pause spending further in the hope that prices will fall. And what you get is a sort of self-fulfilling um, deflationary spiral then at that point, which can be quite hard for policymakers to get out of on a, on a massive scale. So that's one of the key risks of the economy, and that's why um, you will see a lot in the next while about encouraging spending. There's been a bit of a drop-off in vacancies posted. So you can see here the pre-COVID up to the middle of March, you know, sometimes up to 900 vacancies posted in any day. Then you look forward. Um, over the lockdown period, it's been pretty, pretty low and stable. Job postings, interestingly, that has impacted all sectors and occupations. So we would have thought healthcare would have had an increase in terms of um, job postings, but in fact, it's reduced as well, but just not by as much as other sectors. We're also starting to see redundancies being announced across a lot of firms now. So Bombardier, Thompson Aerospace and Allstate um, starting, to, starting to make discussions in the media about their, their redundancy plans. Um, Invest and I also reckon there's potentially about 2,000 um, redundancy plans coming through there as well on an ongoing basis, which will include all three of these companies. So, you know, as things wind down, the, the supports wind down, I think there will be an increase, unfortunately, in redundancies that will be coming forward over the next little while. So wider impacts of COVID, what does that look like across the economy? Um, well, there's a bit of a back to the future feel to a lot of this. So we look at unemployment levels and they've gone back to sort of 1996 pre um, Good Friday Agreement um, levels, worse than the 1998 recession. And the speed of the spike on the right hand side has been very, very rapid. Um, and over a thousand people almost being added in, in one month. So again, last month was May was slightly better than April, but still people being added to that unemployment register. You can see previous recessions here, 2008, um, and then back into the early 1980s, that once we got a, an increase in unemployment um, quite rapidly as a result of the recession, then it began to sort of improve, you know, began to increase over time. Um, we reckon it'll take about 4,000 jobs per annum to be created just to keep the unemployment level as it is, um, and about 95,000 jobs required now to get us back to full employment. So a significant challenge. Youth unemployment at the minute, um, figures are quite lagged, but we would expect that that could get up to maybe 20, 25% of youth um, over the next year or so. So we have about 25,000 kids leaving various forms of education this year. Um, and it'll be really important to get them into some form of apprenticeship, training, education, 
Um, and you know, certainly in terms of digital education and our readiness for the fourth industrial revolution, that's going to be really important because options that were open to them in the past, such as um, uh, migration, gap years across the world, you know, going to work in the mines and the construction industry in Australia, stopgap jobs and maybe agriculture, tourism, hospitality, restaurants and retail. A lot of those aren't open to those kids at this point in time. And you really don't want to see them um, being moved into unemployment or economic inactivity for a long period of time. So those are the scarring effects that people talk about. And we don't really want to see that happening over the next year. So, you know, I'd be quite keen in terms of someone who works in a university that we're seeing a lot of those uh, supports where companies work with us and the um, education institutions try and educate and provide opportunities for a lot of those kids over the next year. Lockdown is taking a serious um, toll on mental health. So you can see here figures from the Institute for Fiscal Studies reckon that mental health incidences um, have, have increased by about half. So, or sorry, they've doubled over the last year. Um, if you look at the younger prof profile of the population, you can see here that actually younger people are more impacted than, than older age groups. Um, some of the happiest people um, actually are over 65s at this point in time. And there's a degree of insulation from what's happening because pensions, payments, and all of those sorts of things that have already been cashed in or realized, um, those are the things that really haven't changed for them. So whilst that's the most impacted group in terms of the potential healthcare challenges, in economic terms, it's certainly um, the younger people that are they're feeling most of the pinch. Income inequality in education is very worrying as well. So there's a lot of kids in low-income groups that won't have it necessarily have access to um, good quality internet. Their data times are going to be limited. You know, there will be multiple devices in one household that can't necessarily get online at all, all at the same time. Um, and they won't have access to private tutors. So those are things where the, the poorest groups in society are going to be most impacted. So there's a challenge here for low-income groups and digital inclusion um, and keeping those kids um, engaged in education because there's a lot of evidence that you know, a, a year out of school is going to knock back your earning potential um, by almost a, a tenth of your lifetime as well. A worrying stat that came from the London School of Economics was looking through some previous papers was that if you enter the labour market you're in a recession, you have a, about a 120th increase in the likelihood of ever being arrested. So the likelihood of children being involved in criminal activity um, in the longer term does actually increase, and this is a direct result of vulnerability um, and low, lower op opportunities across, um, across time. So again, very worrying, and the public sector will have to bear the cost of those um, fallouts in terms of the policing, the justice response, and also the healthcare response to a lot of those things. So there are longer term costs to the public sector um, if those kids are not given all the opportunities at this point in time. So all the research shows, um, published by a range of organisations, that young people um, and those who are just about to enter the labour market are, are most challenged and their earning potential could increase. Those with low qualifications, low wages, part-timers and freelancers, those aren't dig digitally connected or enabled. Um, and certainly those with caring responsibilities as well are, are challenged in terms of their flexibility and getting back. So sectors, retail, manufacturing, tourism and entertainment, and then geographies that have a, a higher share of those types of industries and a lower share of professional services and public sector. So those were already disadvantaged groups and areas before the crisis. And really what's happened is that uh, those impacts have been escalated or ramped up over the last, last couple of months. So as we look to the future, there's a question of, you know, how do we build better? How do we maintain some of the reduced impacts on environmental um, and gas, greenhouse gas emissions. But how do we keep some of the better aspects of you know, the productivity increases from working from home, potentially, the fact that my Zoom meetings are now half an hour um, and not an hour of a meeting and one and a half or two hours commuting around them as well. So those types of productivity increases have been great. So how do we actually realize the benefits of those in the longer term? Well, realistically, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and say that um, this is a significant recession. We have a mountain in front of us, and it's going to take a number of years to regain that lost ground. If you look at public sector debt here, you know, we've lost, we've gone back to sort of 1963, I think, um, in terms of the debt uh, ratio for the UK government. So we're going to reach um, a level here where debt is the same size as output. Debt equals the size of the economy, really, this month. So again, challenges, but look, it's not fatal. Debt's been higher than that before. Um, the government has a number of options in terms of 
um, borrowing more and printing more money as well. Um, and it can fund some of that um, public debt. So we don't necessarily need to revert to austerity just yet. We need to get out of this um, recession that we're in. And the public sector has a massive role in terms of funding that. GVA, um, employment, unemployment index reduction, you know, we've all gone back sort of maybe two, three, four, five years, depending on which indicator you look at. As I said before, you're going to need to increase about 4,000 um, jobs per annum just to keep unemployment levels at the same rate as we have more kids coming into the labour market um, and fewer older people leaving at 65. Public sector has provided a massive shot in the arm um, and there's sectors that are certainly returning to work. So those things are good. And crisis also brings a lot of opportunities. So I think we can appreciate the speed of transformation. So, you know, whilst that was absolutely required, you know, nobody would have thought that you could have got that level of remote working or that level of digital transformation over such a short period of time. We also can look at things that potentially we don't need to fund as well. So I think in a lot of organizations, there is an opportunity to say, well, A, B, C, and D potentially didn't work as well as um, J, K, and L. So we'll, we'll cut back on certain things and we'll do more of the things that actually work. So it does bring an opportunity at this point in time to do things differently. Um, and that's at an institutional economy-wide and an individual, individual level. So there is an opportunity here to build back better. So what I think is going to happen over the next um, number of months, I think in the short term, you're going to see the UK government spending more and reducing taxes to try and boost consumption further and give the economy in the UK a broader shot in the arm, trying to encourage business investment um, and exports as well, trying to bring in more money from outside. So I think you'll see VAT, potentially income tax cuts and other um, tax initiatives and spend initiatives to stimulate the economy and try and sort of, it's a Keynesian policy to try and get us out of this um, environment the medium term, you know, I hope to see a fiscal recovery, but, you know, we're unlikely to see a return to the likes of the 2009 style of austerity. So, you know, the government is quite a low cost of borrowing um, at this point in time. I think the focus in the UK is going to be on two things. It'll be firstly in growth and then secondly in sharing out the, the impact of that growth. So competitiveness, boosting income. So investments in r and i and skills and infrastructure and enterprise the traditional productivity drivers that we would have talked about going back maybe a decade, a decade and a half. You've then got the equality and sustainability agenda that's uh, moved further up the policy um, scale across the UK. So it's much more now about focusing on regional levelling up, environmental sustainability and inclusive growth. So who knows if we had um, those things in place maybe over the past like, decade and less austerity, um, potentially what way the Brexit um, vote would have gone because the Brexit votes, a lot of that was based on um, regions being disadvantaged, groups being disadvantaged, um, and perceptions that other groups were doing better um, across society. Locally, um, I think we're going to have to make the most of the additional spending in 2021. Um, if you add together the COVID 1.3 billion and then potentially COVID um, job response scheme, I think that furlough scheme could be worth about a billion so far to Northern Ireland. Um, there's a massive increase in public spending here and we have to make the most of that this year because I can't see it um, going back to those levels for 2021-22 and um, the next financial year. We need to return to work safely and soon-ish if we can. And then we also need to focus on competitiveness here to, grow, to boost incomes and grow the economy and then sharing in a sustainable future. So similarly to the UK, I think we do need to focus on automation and digitization. We need to boost incomes and well-being in the longer term. Infrastructure is important, and especially supporting the digital infrastructure in terms of helping people work from home and learn from home, and then a, a flexible return to work as we do a, a, a composition of blended learning and blended working at home and in the office. There's also the construction impacts in the shorter term, which enables the local construction industry to return to work. That's important also for childcare um, and speaking as a parent. So the flexibility that better remote working um, and connectivity gives you in terms of when and how you'll return to work is very important. Yeah. Enterprise and employment. So looking at how we boost startups, some of that will be forced to entrepreneurship, how we encourage growth supports, and then also looking at local supply chains. So previously stuff that was bought outside Northern Ireland, um, there's a, certainly a focus on localization versus uh, globalization that we would have seen in the past. And that's one of the trends that potentially has flipped on its head um, as a result of, of COVID, whereas the likes of others such as digitization and online shopping has, a, has just accelerated trends. 
sustainable futures, you know, more focus on well-being, quality of life. We have significant mental health issues that we need to deal with, and we generally fund those at a less um, high level on a per capita basis in other parts of the UK. So that's certainly moved up the policy agenda. How we support young people via education, apprenticeships, digital education, placements and voluntary placements are certainly going to be important. Um, helping people get into employment and getting them up the career value chain will certainly be important over the next number of months and years. So what do we expect and what's going to be expected of citizens and business over the next number of months? I think, you know, as we emerge from this, it's pretty clear we all have a, a part to play. So businesses need to think about how we invest and how we prepare for the upturn. So certainly the crisis will end. There's nothing, you know, there's no doubt about that. Crisis start and crisis end. And we need to think about cost cutting in the longer term. So if you're cutting back in suppliers, you know, they cut back in their suppliers and that trickles down through supply chain. So you do want your suppliers to be in good shape coming out of the, the recession as well. And part of this is about working with others um, across the economy. We need to set, think about spending locally and supporting small enterprises as well. So, you know, generally small enterprises are gen that, those that are a little bit more vulnerable. They're the ones with lower cash balances. They're the ones that are more likely to go into insolvency in two, three, four months. Um, so think about how you support the local economy. And then spare a thought for decision makers and policy makers. So, you know, there's a lot of criticism around where rapid policy responses maybe have um, been a catch-all, but very blunt. Um, but that's, a, that's the nature of, of very fast um, policy responses. Careful responses can take a long time to deploy. Um, they will catch specific groups, and that's where we're going to see policy moving to over the next number of months. But every policy has a cost, it has a budget. There are winners and losers, and there are those that are just outside a threshold. Um, and whilst budgets are certainly larger this year than they were, they are finite. Um, and again, you know, it's about being more careful, I suppose, in the longer term with those policy responses and trying to mop up those that haven't been caught. Um, and if we look at the sectors that are most impacted, focusing on those that are in policy need most at this point in time. So if you're supported now, there's a question, you know, how would you support the economy on the way out? Um, would you be willing to pay more tax in the longer term to fund public services? So if you've got rates rebates now, um, what does the future look like? So are we willing to pay prescription charges, water charges? All of those things need to be on the table um, in the future for how we fund our public services. Equally, we need to get good value for public services. Um, and if we're funding at the same level as the UK, then we should expect you know, a similar level of outcome, whether that's cross rating this or highway system or whatever that is. So you know, a combination of good value and look into the future. So our business is willing to help us design courses that are required, fund an apprenticeship, take a placement student. Um, are you willing to bring people in from the unemployed and inactive and help scale them up? Because those are people that are quite far from the labour market and will need more support. So, you know, working together in the future. But what I would say is we need to begin to try and behave and spend in more normal ways over the next number of months. Um, and that applies to all of us if we want things to return to normal. So we all talk about your normality, the 90% economy, the new normal. Um, but again, it can't just be for others, it has to be for everybody. So that's the, the presentation. Hopefully you've found that pretty useful and I'm happy to take questions now. So those are our contact details. I'm happy to share the slides. You can contact Kirsty or I afterwards um, and just let us know. So thank you very Richard, much. Richard, thank you very much. Very comprehensive as always. And just to say we have recorded this session, so uh, we will share the recording with everyone and also the slides because I'm sure a lot of you would like to see more of the detail. We do have a question from one of your fellow economists, Alan Bridal in uh, Bank of Ireland. He's keen to get your thoughts on the risks of local businesses being caught in a COVID-19 debt trap, particularly with C-bills and, and the bounce back. Um, what's your view on that? I suppose the high level of corporate debt. Yeah, well, that's a good, it's a good question because really going into the session, we had um, higher levels of debt at, at a consumer level, certainly going in. We had lower levels of fixed capital formation and capital investment by businesses in Northern Ireland. Um, one area that is very, very difficult to get good data on um, is automation and digitization. But if you look at a lot of the sort of company interactions and surveys that were carried out, um, the level of automotive and um, digital engagement has been lower in Northern Ireland in general. So, you know, I think there's a, a risk here that um, potentially some zombie companies could be created. We saw that in the last recession where companies unfortunately had to limp along for a period of time. Um, some recovered, some didn't in the in the longer term. But um, it's a challenge for policymakers in terms of picking 
winners and losers and identifying those firms that are sort of capable of having a recovery potentially in an industry that looks like a, a 90% level of aggregate demand that, that would be there previously. So is it 90% of companies um, that survive or is it 90% of demand that survives with 90% of companies? Um, and I think that's going to be certainly a challenge for policymakers over the next number of months um, mm -hmm. and a challenge for businesses as you look at how and when they eventually can emerge from this. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. certainly a challenge um, is yeah. the question. Any further questions to use the chat function? We've probably time for a few more, but uh, one question we've seen uh, economies like America have used the helicopter funds, which I know you've spoke about, Richard, where every citizen gets a thousand pound to stimulate disposal on the consumer demand. Do you think, and certainly I know in the Republic of Ireland, they're looking at a, a voucher to stimulate demand in the tourism sector. Do you think the UK government may follow suit on that initiative? Yeah, it's... As you know, that's something we talked about way back in March, and it's it's a very it's a very topical debate to sort of run on from that point in time. Um, there's the question of helicopter money. Do you just give everybody a thousand pounds and or fifteen hundred pounds and hope that that gets spent across the economy? Mm -hmm. Issues with that sort of thing would be um, the fact that I might buy an iPhone or I might put it towards a car or things that are produced outside Northern Ireland, and um, so you don't necessarily stimulate the local economy as much as potentially you could. Voucher schemes, in my view, are much better because you can focus them on things like tourism, hospitality, arts, entertainment, um, areas that are most impacted, um, and you can boost consumption. So certainly that's something I don't think should be off the table in the, the medium, mm -hmm. short to medium term. Um, I have less support for maybe just pure heli helicopter money where, yeah. say, 1.9 million people get the voucher because older people will, for example, have a large propensity to save that. Um, some people will spend it outside Northern Ireland. Um, but I think the voucher scheme itself will, will potentially be something that we could look at in the future. UK government haven't really discussed it at this point, as far as I know, um, in much detail. But you mm -hmm. know, these things are all on the table as we look at the autumn, and hopefully we don't have a second wave. But um, you know, who knows what the what the policy framework will be by October if we get into that environment. Richard, a few more questions come through. So inclusive growth, how would policies in Northern Ireland look different with the genuine commitment to inclusive growth that benefits everyone? Yeah, well, again, you're back to what gets measured, gets done. Um, and I think if you're looking at inclusive growth, you know, what that will require will be the likes of geographical targets, income group targets, and all of those sorts of things. So you know, if we're creating jobs across Northern Ireland and they're focused in one or two specific areas, if they're focused in urban areas rather than rural, if they're focused in east rather than west, how do we target? How do we then incentivize? And you know, if we design the target framework correctly, then the policy framework will begin to follow behind that. Um, higher levels of support for areas that are outside the core business districts that are already recovering. Higher levels of support for sectors that are um, struggling. And higher levels of support then for occupations that maybe are most disadvantaged. And again, looking at low income groups, more intervention there in terms of the people that need support most. Um, those are not digitally included. You know, would we, for instance, include um, retrofitting of all houses? How much fibre to a home would we invest in? What would we do? And um, because the kids that are in low-income households there potentially can't get on the internet to study. Um, yeah. and that's a significant challenge. So, mm -hmm. there's lots of policy interventions that can be done, but I think we need to look at a framework where targets are identified for inclusive growth, and then if we measure a report on it and we do that on an annual basis, then then we begin to get there. Uh, Richard, another question around, um, obviously, the anticipated reduction in occupancy in offices. What do you think will be the medium and long-term impact on corporate real estate and the associated service sectors? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, that's one of the factors where there are winners and losers across the, across the piece. So, as we all know, we have been pivoted to work at home quite quickly. Um, that's worked for a lot of employers and in fact you know potentially that's going to be a cheaper alternative for them to have 25 percent of their workforce at home over the next number of years um, universities banks professional services all of those types of industries and organizations are are benefiting in, in some way from having people work at home um, there is a, a cost saving for them potentially in the longer term but unfortunately a cost saving for one sector is a cost reduction or an income reduction for another so um, it could be a challenge across the next um, number of years for, for corporate real estate, unfortunately. Um, and looking across Belfast, then there's a question of what we do and how we re-engineer the city centre and, and potentially other town centres across Northern Ireland. So 
what is what does a different retail environment look like um, in a city centre context? What is a different office environment look like? Um, and then how do you get people back to work? Um, and that impacts then on coffee shops, restaurants, all of those um, areas that are already impacted across Northern Ireland. So yeah, that's a certainly one of the areas that I think we'll see a, a significant disruption mm -hmm. um, at this point and, and have to take over the next number of years, unfortunately. Richard, that's all the questions. Thank you very much again for your excellent contribution. And it's, it's always a very holistic view of how the economy impacts long term as well. So very interesting to see some of the statistics as well, but also to see some of the best practice. So as I said, we will share the recording of, of this webinar with everyone and the slides. Um, just wanted to highlight a few webinars that we're running. So we've one next Friday for young directors on pivoting into recovery with uh, Kieran Kennedy from O'Neill's. Um, so you may be interested in that one around a lot of us obviously are still working from home. So how do you establish that culture remotely webinar on Monday, the 29th of June? And we have the Chief Medical Officer, Michael McBride, who will be joining us on the 2nd of July. So if you're interested in any of those, please do let Chelsea know. I've just had one final question come through from Lee Reynolds for you, Richard. We'll, we'll close with that one. Digital infrastructure, will we be better aiming being first 100% 5G region rather than broadband? I know you've done a lot of work in this recently. So. Yeah, um, I suppose it's, it's getting the evidence as well about how much um, better is 5G than fiber and you know, what's the economic benefit across all of those. But what I will say is Northern Ireland has a very competitive broadband infrastructure network. So it's something that we actually can, we can be proud that we're ahead of other regions. It's a lot to do with previous DETI and DFE investments um, going back over the last decade, maybe decade and a half. So we have a good fibre network, we have good broadband connectivity, we're in the top third of countries internationally that we compete with um, in terms of that broadband infrastructure. What I would say is that um, a lot of other countries are, are playing that game, it's a dynamic game, and they're improving quite rapidly. So we need, to, we need to keep at that game and we need to continue to improve our broadband infrastructure, fibre right to the premises, 5G, um, and the whole, the whole piece effectively to ensure that that's one element of what we do that remains competitive. It's important for getting FDI to come to Northern Ireland because they need to be well connected. It's important for us to be flexible and well connected to being able to work at home. Um, it enables childcare because you know people who work at home are enabled to work at different points in time across the day. So there's lots of reasons there why um, behaviours have changed as a result of COVID and have accelerated. Um, and I'm not necessarily able to answer just the difference between 5G and uh, free fibre. Or whatever, but you know, those are very, very important um, infrastructure and competitiveness elements that we need to build upon going forward. So um, that's, a, that's a good point in terms of what we do in competitiveness, but equally, um, we have lots of plates in the air. We need to build and focus on our education and skills system. We need to improve the broader infrastructure. We need to improve how we support businesses in terms of boosting innovation in R&D and R&D. So, you know, there's lots of things that go along with um, mm -hmm. digital infrastructure. There's not just one silver bullet here. Um, yeah. Thanks, Richard. We finished precisely on time. So thanks again for you, Richard, for your contribution. Thanks to everyone for your questions, for participating. And as I said, we will share the slides. And if you're interested in some of our future webinars, please let us know. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. So thanks very much.